But what I really want to talk to you about is um, the autonomy project progress. And some of that will be uh, to report on things which are still in progress, even though this is a final event, as Wayne said, of a particular funded project. There's various things which are still coming out, and we've got a writing up here. <laughs> so some of it will be more prospective than retrospective. As Wayne said, um, one of the things which was really distinctive of the project over three years was the collaborative work. And as I also recognize a lot of faces in the room. And I just want to briefly um, highlight all the various organizations with whom we, at various points, have worked together or continue to work together. And most importantly, here, the Institute of Philosophy is hosting us and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which has funded us. At the Ministry of Justice, the Office of the Public Guardian, the Court Service, the Law Commission, the Office of the British Solicitor, uh, the British Medical Association, Amnesty International, and the Irish Context, the House of um, Parliament in Ireland, and various other organisations. And we're very thankful for all that collaboration and input. Now, quite a few of you also have been at over a dozen of our events, so a lot of it you will know, but I should just tell you a little bit about how it all started. It started partly <coughs> by a book by, by Martin, Theories of Justice, and some collaborative work I've done with Gareth in the audience, and some other people in the audience, I don't know, I haven't seen Geneva yet. Yeah, but she's there. Ah, there we go. Um, and Matthew Hutter, who can't be here today. And then, one of the first methodologies we wanted to do is what, wrote what we call Green Paper Technical Report. Try to summarize a state of play in a particular area in relation to a particular issue. And if you look at our website, you will find say, seven of these which have been published in the world. Then we started to publish some of our um, research articles, partly, again, collaborative work like this one, and partly collaborative work uh, both within the team and from outside the team. So I won't talk about this particular one, but this is to do with best interest which obviously relates to our debate this afternoon, uh, because one of the key pieces of the MCA has to do with best interest, and there are some who object to its compliance with the UN just on that basis. There are other articles we've been published, and I'm going to say a little bit about their content as I go along. Um, there's other things which are still in the working again, some collaborative work which has been particularly fruitful with Gareth's project on the Wellcome Trust on decision-making in free patients groups. So we're starting to publish some of that material, and I'll briefly come back to it at the end. And just this week, there's another article which was accepted by Tom in the Journal of Moral Philosophy. And I can't obviously do justice to all of that today, so I'm just going to stand back a little bit and try to report on some of these results, and also some of the news ends which we would like to follow up, both at this conference today and in the realms and years to come. So, what was the project about? The project had this very ambitious aim. The aim was to clarify the nature and value of autonomous judgment with the aim of developing a conception which is philosophically defensible and can be used in practice. <coughs> now, it might look that these two criteria, the two desiderata, philosophically defensible and workable in practice, sound like they are kind of distinct criteria. But in fact, one of the things which was important for our project was to test what is philosophically defensible against real cases, against what is workable in practice, and the real cases we encountered and you often brought to us. So in a way, I'm going to just talk about defensible from now on, but defensible for us involves how it can be used in practice and how it plays out in practice. Now, I think this was a very ambitious aim, and in three years, we can't say we'd be um, fully mapped it. We can't say that we build the conception of autonomy which needs this desiderata. But I think we come closer to it. And I think one of the things which uh, people always say about philosophy, it doesn't give you results, I want to disagree with. I think we made some progress. And one of the results we've made, I think, is that we've come up with some constraints on what a defensible conception of autonomy is. So we don't have a holy grail. We don't have that conception yet. We're working on it. But we have some constraints on what that conception is. And we have some diagnosis of where we think some of the debates have gone wrong, have been slightly uh, miscalibrated, misunderstood, misconceptualized. And I want to report mainly on these constraints on a construction of a defensible conception today. 
And particularly, I want to report on four of them. Firstly, I think autonomy cannot be captured successfully by actually normative substance. You can't have a normatively neutral conception of autonomy. I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean with normatively neutral in a moment. Secondly, oops. Secondly, autonomy ain't just in the head. It is relational and it can be distributed among people. It's not just something which is a psychological structure. It's not just something which you can find by putting people in a brain skin. Thirdly, autonomy is valuable, I think we want to say. But one of the conferences we held, you might remember, is on the critics of autonomy. And we want to accept that some criticism of autonomy have a right, um, and um, we should revise our conception such that we recognize that autonomy is not an unconditional good and that it does not trump all values you know, in every context. And finally, I want to talk about the fourth constraint, which is again more on the practical side, if you like. Um, I think we learned a lot about autonomy by learning about the Mental Capacity Act, and we learned a lot about the Mental Capacity Act by seeing how we could operationalize it and try to test for mental capacity, and at least indirectly thereby for autonomy. But I think one of the things we've discovered is that we need to enlarge the range of capacity we assess when we're assessing autonomy. And we're going to briefly talk about one such capacity, namely temporal capacity, at the end. Okay, that's basically where I, that's the kind of menu of what I will talk about this morning. But I will concentrate mainly on the first one. And um, then we have a break and you can or well, not a break, we're going to have a discussion period where you can quiz me and see whether I have convinced you that, in fact, we can't have a normatively neutral conception of autonomy. Okay, and in order to do that, I want to motivate a little bit, first of all, why one might think we should have actually normative systems, why we should think we have, should have a normatively neutral account. And I think that has to do with an idea of liberal neutrality. I'll explain what it is in a moment. And then, I think, the idea is that people respond to this kind of problem. How can we have autonomy-based legislation, autonomy-based public policy <coughs> in a liberal context? The response to that often is that we should have a procedural understanding of autonomy. An understanding which doesn't lay down which values you have to choose, but just lays down a certain procedures you have to choose in order to be autonomously make a decision. And then I want to object to that, that this purported answer doesn't work. I want to object it doesn't capture well when mental disorder disrupts autonomy. I want to say that it doesn't handle well the fact that when we assess autonomy, we need to find recognizable reasons, and that constrains uh, the normative <coughs> neutrality we can operate with, that rules it out. And I want to say that there is a kind of fundamental mistake in the very purported answer, namely that procedures are normatively neutral. I want to say they are not. And then, giving you all that despair, I want to say briefly something about where we, where that might leave us. Okay. So, what are conceptions of autonomy for, you might think? Well, one function, conception of autonomy I have, is that they're meant to send the boundary. They're meant to set the boundary for what the state can do to individuals. In particular, they are meant to set the boundary against paternalistic intervention. So in one of our events, John Crispin, one of the theorists from the US, came and said, autonomy is a shield. It shields you against paternalistic intervention. That's what autonomy is about, or at least that's what the conception of autonomy we're talking about, that's what we should, 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 should search for. And the idea here is that particularly we are living in a context of a pluralist society, where that means we have different conceptions of the good, and not just different conceptions of the good, it is the case that reasonable people disagree about values, norms, and the good. What do I mean there? Reasonable pluralism means that even people who are willing to be convinced by arguments would, after free discussion, take a different stand on <coughs> values and norms. And if that's a fact, if there's a fact of reasonable pluralism that there are these kind of disagreements, then you might think the way we justify the use of state power has to recognize and acknowledge that fact in a way which leaves room for these different reasonable worldviews. So what we want, particularly in the British context, we want to protect unpopular, eccentric, and even unwise decisions 
against paternalistic interference of the state. So the question is, can we have a conception of autonomy which protects us against unwarranted paternalistic intervention of, uh, of a state in a way which is recognizing the fact that people reasonably disagree about the good is, and in fact, what other values are. And in a way, this takes the cue from some philosophers and some long theory, namely from John Stuart Mill, for example, who says, the only freedom which deserves a name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way. So in our own way is really <coughs> this idea of the state should not get in, in the business of telling us how we pursue our own freedom unless obviously we break the law and harm other people. Then the state can involve. But when it is to our own good is concerned, then we should be allowed to do so and to pursue that in our own way. No one should tell us what our good is or how we should pursue it. So sometimes people talk about that as value neutrality. The state should be neutral as respect to the conception of a good of its citizens when it justifies its power. I want to understand it a little bit wider than that. I want to understand it as normative neutrality. You might think, if we reasonably disagree about the conception of a good, we also reasonably disagree about how we would justify a conception of a good, and how certain kind of epistemic standards <coughs> might function. For example, a religious believer might think, that certain forms of learning about what they take to be the truth um, are acceptable, and someone who is a very much a natural scientist would reject these very avenues of inquiry. So I want to say what liberal neutrality ultimately is about is letting people pursue their own good in, a, in their own way, and even when it comes to justifying the way they justify their own good, or the way they reason about this, we want to be neutral. Now, to illustrate that a little bit more, I want to say that this idea of liberal neutrality is not just a philosopher's idea. In fact, it's very much part of the law. So here is a famous common law judgment by Lady Justice Bertha Sloss, who says, irrationality is no barrier to competence, to capacity, even when a decision is, and I quote, so outrageous in its defiance of logic or of accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied this mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. So this is really neutrality at its utmost. Even if a person decides for reasons which no one can make sense of from the outside, we want to be able to accept that they can still be competent and autonomous. Particularly, she also says, a mentally competent patient has an absolute right to refuse to consent to medical treatment for any reason, rational, irrational, or for no reason at all. So this is really, if you want to have a kind of quick way to understand what normative neutrality is about, it's this idea. We can decide for any reason, rational, irrational, or no reason at all. And even when that decision may lead to his or her own death. And you know, all of you, that similar idea is not just in the common law, and then what the judges say, but it's also in statute. So the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 says famously one of its main principles, a person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision merely because he makes an unwise decision. So again, this is a commitment to this idea of neutrality. But how can you have neutrality and at the same time pursue an autonomy-based uh, public policy and law? Well, the purported answer to that is, you need to have an understanding of autonomy which is itself compatible with neutrality, which is itself normatively neutral. And that conception of autonomy is supposed to be procedural, and there are different competing conceptions of that kind, but they share certain common features. In particular, they share the feature that you allow to, uh, people to pursue their own good in their own way, as long as they are capable of following the relevant decision-making process. So if you think of the MCA, you have to have the four abilities and be able to exercise the four abilities of understanding and retaining the relevant information, of using and weighing that relevant information and expressing a choice. These four abilities are meant to be such that you can operationalize them in a decision-making process which is meant to be normatively neutral. And as long as you can follow that process, then you are autonomous or competent in the first instance of the MCA. And the idea particularly here is that that process itself doesn't determine what you choose. It doesn't determine the content of that choice. So that idea of proceduralism is that we 
um, check for how people choose. We have a functional test of autonomy and competence, not what they choose. It's not an outcome test or a content-based test. Now, one way in, in which you can understand what a doctrine says is to look at its opposite. So let's look briefly at its opposite. So the idea, again, of proceduralism is you just have to follow the process of how and it's meant to be content neutral. So what is the opposite of that? What is the contrast? The contrast is meant to be substantivism. Here the doctrine is that you cannot be autonomous if you make certain kind of choices, if you make not the process of choosing, but if you choose certain kind of outcomes, you choose certain kind of behaviors. So there might be various examples. You might think on a substantive conception of autonomy, I cannot autonomously decide to sell myself into slavery. Whenever someone decides to sell themselves into slavery, if it were legal, say, they would not be acting autonomously. But just by looking at the outcome of their choice, you know that they're not autonomous on the substantive conception. Or to commit suicide, or to remain in an abusive relationship, or to live in squalor. Sometimes when we went to events with social workers, they're saying, the fact that this person chooses to live in scholar means that they lack in autonomy. So in this case, such a person is operating with a substantive conception of autonomy. And the claim is that this conception of autonomy violates liberal neutrality. Here you're taking a stance on what it is to live your life in your own way. The state is saying, no, you can't live your life in an own way where that means you live in squalor. You can't live your way autonomously where that means you choose to remain in an abusive relationship. In that case, you, uh, the state would take a stand on what is really valuable, what is a good life to live. And the claim is that this you shouldn't do in our liberal environment. Now I want to say that I, the aspiration of liberal neutrality is admirable. But I think that liberal neutrality cannot deliver what it's meant to deliver. And the first step I want to do here is to tell you a little bit about the way substantive accounts, the so-called contrast, I think often mischaracterized. This is the first of the diagnostic step, if you like. I think they're mischaracterized in so far as two conditions are lumped together. When people say, the thing we want to avoid are substantive conceptual autonomy, they mean to say that these conceptions are outcome-based, they, concept, they make autonomy dependent on what kind of choices you make, on the content of these choices, and that they're value-laden, that they're normatively substantive. But I think it's mistaken to think about it in this way, because I think there can be different kinds of substantivism, in particular these two elements, the element of outcome-based, content-constrained, um, content and value-ladenness, normative substance, these two can come apart. So, what I'm going to call direct substantivism is a substantivism, the conception of autonomy which places direct constraints, normative constraints, upon what an agent can decide autonomously. So, a direct constraint would be you can't autonomously choose to live in squalor. That would be a direct <coughs> constraint on the content of what someone can choose autonomously. So these kinds of conceptions are outcome-based and value-based, normatively substantive. But there can be indirect substantive views. And then indirect substantive views imposes indirect constraints upon what an agent can decide autonomously where these constraints are normatively laden. So in a certain sense, these, these indirect substantive views are also functional. They also propose we're looking at how you choose, what kind of abilities and comp competencies are required in choosing autonomously, not what you choose. But they say we have to own up to the fact that the abilities and competencies which we require of you to choose autonomously are themselves not, you can't capture these unless you make a commitment to certain values and norms. You can't capture these procedural and functional tests unless you own up to value labelness and normative substance. So here is one of our speakers, who, uh, Paul Benson, who will speak after me this morning, uh, who describes it, this particular view. This view carries normative content indirectly through the value subsumed in its description of autonomy competency. So the claim here is you can't describe these functional texts and functional uh, understandings of competency in a way which is normatively neutral. 
you have to bring in values and norms which people can possibly reasonably disagree with. In particular, here is Paul Benson, here is a view, and he says, in the account I propose, autonomy's normative substance resides in an agent's attitudes towards their own authority to speak and answer for their decision. So, we find out perhaps more about this view later on, but the basic idea is, you can choose whatever you choose, but you have to choose in a way where you take yourself to be authoritative to make the decision, where you take yourself to be self, having enough self-respect to make that decision. <coughs> So you, it's a functional view, you can choose whatever you choose, but you have to choose it in such a way that you take yourself to have the authority to speak and answer for your decision. But the key thing I want to focus on now is the next sentence. He says, this proposal occupies a largely neglect neglected <coughs> middle ground between strong substantive theories and content-neutral conceptions of autonomy. Now I'm going to call the content-neutral conception of autonomy, I'm just going to call it proceduralism for now. But what I want to say is whether or not we agree with this particular view about self-respect is something we can discuss later today. What I want to focus on is whether, in fact, Benson is right to characterize the autonomy uh, debate, the landscape, if you like, as having these three camps, a strongly substantive, a direct substantive one, an indirect substantive one, and a procedural content neutral one. What I want to say is that, in fact, I want to slam the door on the idea that there are such things as content-neutral conceptions of autonomy. I think we can only choose, ultimately, between direct and indirect substantive views. Which of these we choose, we can debate further, but I don't think we actually have that third option. So here's the thesis. Contrary to common assumptions, no content-neutral conception of autonomy is defensible. There is no proceduralism in that particular sense. Proceduralism in the sense that you can describe the procedures at issue in a normative <coughs> way. And I'm going to try to make you, uh, to report on some of the ways in which we um, have argued this, or some of us have argued this, by talking about three issues. I want to say, as I said earlier, that <coughs> supposedly procedural notions of autonomy can't handle mental disorder well and the way it interferes with autonomy. It can't deal with the fact that in order when we assess autonomy, we need to find recognizable reasons, not any reasons. And I want to say that it overlooks that even procedures have normative systems. Okay. Now, I want to say that certain some forms of mental disorders in relation to some decisions can interfere with autonomy. And I will give you two examples in a moment. I also want to say that that is widely accepted. Although, if you look at the program, we will have one talk later on this afternoon where it might be called into doubt by uh, Derek Bolton. But the proposal is that mental disorder can interfere with autonomy insofar as it can disrupt these kind of competencies which are required for autonomous decision making, where I think these competencies can't be described in a normative neutral way. But particularly here, the thesis is, Procedural accounts cannot track the way in which mental disorder can interfere with um, autonomy um, in the way I think it does. It can't adequately deal with it. So let's take some examples of procedural accounts. Many of you will be familiar with it. The first one is often ascribed to Frankfurt. Here, I'm putting these uh, procedural accounts as a form of question. The question you're going to ask on Frankfurt's account of autonomy, or the one ascribed to him at any rate, is are the lower order volitions endorsed by higher order volitions? Is it the case that you endorse your desires at a higher level of reflection? When you do you desire what? It's not the question just do I desire to drink coffee, but um, and do I want to be the kind of person who desires to drink coffee? Do I desire to desire drinking coffee? That's the question. The second kind of account is not so much asking about the structure of your psychology, that's what Frankfurt is asking about. Crispin is asking about the way whether you achieve some sort of in inconsistent consistency or coherence among your desires and beliefs. So the question is, is the decision minimally rational in the sense that there is no manifestly inconsistent set of desires or beliefs? Thirdly, you might ask, this is again Crispin, but also others have argued, like Craigie, that does the decision or the preferences and values on which it rests express the person's enduring identity? What we need to find out is whether that actually is a person's own views and values, not 
uh, whether these values should be agreed on, but just whether they are their own. Or fourthly, you might ask on this procedural account, is the decision based on preference and values from which the agent would not be alienated if she were to reflect on their genesis? Here the worry is, um, perhaps people accept all sorts of things at a particular time, but their reason only is because they had a traumatic childhood or because um, they were under the undue influence of someone else. And if you told them about that traumatic, if you reminded them of the trauma, or if you reminded them of the undue influence of others, perhaps then they wouldn't actually continue to hold their views anymore. If they continue to hold the views, then they're autonomous. So all of, each of these are an example of procedural views, of purportedly procedural views of autonomy. And I want to say, and I won't go through the reasoning in detail, that these kind of accounts, and any others of that sort, can't handle why the following two examples, and other examples of that sort, interfere with autonomy, or can't handle well in any case. So here's one example. Brittany was abused as a child, and subsequently self-harmed. She's compulsory, de compulsory detained in hospital under Section 3 of the Mental Health Act. In the hospital, she stops eating and her weight falls to a dangerous level. B makes an application to the High Court for an injunction to restrain the health authority from tube feeding her without her consent. She endorses her volition to self-harm as a strategy to deal with her trauma and identifies with her condition. That would mean she would probably meet the first of these tests, that she endorses this volition of self-harm. First test, remember, the Frankfurt test, whether you endorse at a higher level your first order volition. I go on with the example. As difficult as things are, she would not be rid of, of her condition, even if by waving a magic wand it would, could be removed. She would deny that the person emerging from this would be herself. So that, in a way, is meant to capture the fact that she identifies with the condition. It's not that she feels alienated from it. She, she feels it as a part of the very person she is. And if you could change her, she wouldn't be recognizing herself in, in that change anymore. She's fully aware that her self-harming activity is a response to her childhood trauma, and this knowledge does not alienate her from her activity. Again, this is meant to fit with the final test. She sees it as her only way of coping and accepts it, even if it has the possible consequence of death or a severely reduced quality of life. Now, I don't necessarily want to say that this decision to refuse feeding is non-autonomous, but I want to at least say that there can be reasons when to doubt this. And I think that the procedural accounts <coughs> couldn't handle this kind of case well. Because all of the things which they, the resources they have will be such that this person actually seems to have undergone these procedures. And to some extent, perhaps, even is a paradigm of the kind of um, ways in which these procedures can be met. She has a fully consistent worldview. She fully identifies with her position. That's not true of most of them. She knows about the history which generated her desires, and despite that history, she endorses these, and um, so on. But if you're not, I, um, I give you a second example of a similar structure. This is a case actually which um, comes from the collaboration with, with Gareth, Gareth Owen from King's College, London. Roger suffers from diabetes, but he, thinking himself to be God, refuses to take any medicine for it even after being warned that it will endanger his health, well-being, and eventually his life. While he accepts that people who suffer from diabetes should take medication, he reasons that as an immortal, all-knowing, and all-powerful God, he could not be affected by, never mind die from, a physical disease, and at any rate would know if the material body in which he appears to us were ill, and could cure it by an act of will. Roger is not alienated from his belief that he is God and is refusing to diabetes of diabetes medication, even though Roger accepts that the best human explanation for having these beliefs and this refusal is that he suffers from schizophrenia. So here is someone who, in many ways, again, endorses at a higher order le uh, level his lower order volitions, he's identifying with his conditions. Our explanations of why he has these conditions do not alienate him from his holding these beliefs and values, and nonetheless, he um, believes that he is God and doesn't need the diabetes medication. I think again, this is a case where a mental disorder arguably interferes and perhaps even undermines his autonomy capacity. But the procedural accounts cannot capture well why it does so and how it does so. 
I'm going to sound a little bit dogmatic by saying this. There's obviously much more to say in possible replies and rejoinders. But if you want to find out more about this argument, you can turn to this piece which Tom and I have written, which is published in the International uh, Journal of Law and Context. And in fact, I should have said that on the front page of your handout are all the various outputs of the autonomy project, which I mentioned at the beginning. And so you can find the reference there. OK, I want to press on. <coughs> the second reason why I think procedural content neutral accounts of autonomy are non-starter has to do with the following puzzle. <coughs> Remember back the judgment by a lady Butler Slots, who says, someone can be competent even if they decide for rational, irrational, or no reason at all. And I want to say that that statement is in a way puzzling. Because just put yourself, as many of you anyway are, in the shoes of an assessor of that competence and that autonomy. So you have someone in front of you who makes a decision, or seems to make a decision, but does so, <coughs> claims at least, for no reason at all. But how can you be sure that this person is really genuinely making a decision, and an autonomous one? when there's a still a possibility there's someone in front of you who's just incapable of making decisions at all. How can you distinguish a case where someone decides for no reason at all and someone who is incapable of deciding? It seems like a puzzle. And if you think about that puzzle, then it seems that given that we can't keep these cases apart, or at least not very easily, there is a sort of epistemic problem here. Unless we are faced with a decision which exhibits the capacity to decide for oneself, which exhibits certain reasons, which we can recognize as reasons, we cannot know that this is an autonomous choice. We cannot recognize it as such. If someone doesn't volunteer reasons, which we can recognize, if he just says, I make this decision for no reason at all, we couldn't distinguish this case, where it's perhaps a case of genuine autonomy, from another case where someone is just not capable of making decisions at all. So that's, a, first of all, an epistemic problem, the problem of knowing which of these two cases we are faced with. But if you think about it more, it seems like that epistemic lack of knowledge, the lack of epistemic access, might mean that there's a deeper problem. You can claim, in particular, that there's an ontological problem. For autonomy is not, perhaps cannot be, a private matter, something wholly independent of being recognized by others. So if no assessor can tell between the case where someone lacks autonomy altogether, or someone who doesn't exercise an autonomy and just decides randomly without any reasons, then it might be the case we want to say, if you really couldn't tell the two apart, then they are not apart. They are not two different things. <coughs> if you really can't find out whether there are reasons here which we can recognize, then in a way, there is no autonomy there. That doesn't mean that we can't have autonomous decisions which are unwise, but there's a limit to what we can still recognize as a decision. The decision has to be made not on no reason for all at all, but at some point someone has to volunteer recognizable reasons, or it isn't a decision at all. So the claim is, the reasons have to be recognizable for us not just to know which of the two cases there are, but actually for, our, for, our, for there to be at all a case of autonomous decision making. And that is, as little as I like to take uh, issue with Butler's loss's judgments in many ways, I think this is where she goes wrong. That Lady Justice Butler's loss was wrong to conclude that we can make a competent decision so outrageous in the defiance of logic of, or of acceptable moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. Yes, we can make a decision which is outrageous insofar as many people wouldn't make that choice. We can make a decision which goes against accepted moral standards. But we can't make a decision which is so outrageous that no sensible person could have arrived at it. And we can't make sense from the outside of it. In that case, I think we have to say, this is not decision making. <clears throat> this is lack of decision making. In that sense, we have to have a constraint on our assessment of autonomy, and I think therefore a constraint on autonomy itself, which means that proceduralism is not a viable option. We have to accept and the constraint on autonomy is that people act, uh, act on recognizable reasons, 
And for us, two reasons to be recognizable has to do with certain values and norms which we accept, the assessor accept, and hence we can't be normatively neutral. We can't just say whatever norms or values they have, we will accept that this person is autonomous. No, in order to even recognize them as autonomous, we have to invoke certain norms and values in order to make sense of them as decision makers. And if we can't make the sense, then they're not decision makers. Final point. <coughs> Remember the idea. Proceduralism was a purported answer to this challenge. How can we be liberally neutral and have an autonomy view? And the key was, well, the solution is we have a procedural view of autonomy, and that's meant to be normatively neutral. And I think that purported answer rests on a fundamental mistake. Namely, it rests on the mistake that the distinction between procedural and content neutral fits exactly on the distinction between normatively neutral and normative substance. But I think these two distinctions don't overlap completely. They overlap to some extent. I think the problem is that people assume that if you make a procedural test, make procedural demands on people, then, then you don't make, bring in any normative substance. But that's just not true about procedures. Procedures embody values. They embody norms. And often they embody values and norms about which we can reasonably disagree. Just think about some examples. Think about an example from the context of democratic theory. In this country, we have a first-past-the-post system of electing our representative. In some other jurisdictions, we have a proportional representation system. If you understand about why we have these different procedures, you understand, you have to understand that they embody different values. The first past the post system is you, have, you want to have a fairly decisive outcome, you want to have one person responsible, directly responsible for a constituency, which you can hold accountable, and so on. The proportional representation idea is that every vote should count, that everything should be represented, not just the majority which wins a seat. These are different value orientation which are embodied in these different electoral principles of enacting democracy. Think of another example. Think of the criminal law context. You might think the procedures we adopt in the criminal law context are just normatively neutral, but I think in many ways they're not. We understand in our liberal modern world that the criminal law context should be done by due process. That involves certain kind of norms, that you're innocent until proven guilty, that there is a burden of, is, of proof is on the prosecutor. But you could have a different criminal law system where your guilt or innocence is proven by a trial of ordeal, a trial of combat. Where the burden of proof is, for example, different. It embodies a different value, a different norm. But both of them are just procedures. And if you think a little bit more about the closer to home, if you like, about the particular <coughs> test we looked at, one test, remember, was about the absence of inconsistency. And you might think, so as long as people reason in a way which is minimally consistent, or perhaps more, or maximally consistent, then they are autonomous. But why should we think that consistency of procedures which check for consistency don't again embody a value? Isn't that the value that we have to live our lives consistently, again, something which we can contest? Might there not, for example, be moral dilemmas such that we can't be fully consistent because we see the pull of both sides of the dilemma? Or we might say, people might say, well, this idea of consistency is just a norm of a kind of boring, bourgeois person who just wants to live in this kind of particular kind of world and get on with it, with it well. No, but we want all these eccentrics who are inconsistent, who do all sorts of things which are different. So even this idea of consistency as something which is embodied in a procedure is a contestable value. Similarly, people have criticized the MCA by being in a way too cognitive, into intellectual. The idea that you have to understand and retain the information and use a way to reason it out, in a way, you might think, if you really had to do that with all our decisions, that's having an ideal imposed on us, namely the ideal that we examine our life all the time, that we weigh things up, and we go through this deliberative process. But that's also a particular conception of norms and values, uh, which you might share or not, but it's not so innocent, these procedures. So the key point is, Again, this also suggests that proceduralism is not a viable option. So where do we go from here? I think we only have two of the three options left. We only have direct substantivism, where we constrain direct the, con the content of people's choices on the basis of norms and values. Or indirect substantivism, where we require that they go and undergo certain procedures and have certain competencies 
but we own up to the fact that these procedures and competencies can't be adequately described without bringing in contestable values and norms. So I propose we have to abandon normative neutrality. We should accept that substantive value and norms are part of our conception of autonomy and have a role to play in its assessment. And particularly, I want to say that we should adopt indirect substantialism. Of the two options left, we should choose the second one, indirect substantialism. Why so? Because indirect substantialism is an ability account. It's about your having the competency, competencies to make an autonomous decision, where the competencies can't be described adequately without normative values. But if you have the ability, you cannot exercise it. You can still choose unwisely, eccentrically, in all sorts of ways, as long as you can have the ability to reason in the way which our autonomy competencies require. So that leaves, this indirect substantialism leaves still some room for the things which we wanted to protect in the first place. It still leaves some room for unwise decision and eccentricity. But it doesn't leave perhaps as much space as normative neutrality. But I think normative neutrality, I've been trying to suggest to you, is not an option anyway. So we can leave some space for the things we want to protect, unwise decision and eccentricity, but we have to own up to the normative substance. So how does that fit with reasonable pluralism, and how does that fit with our liberal context? Well, I think if we can't be normatively neutral, as I say, we have to own up to it. We have to be transparent about it and bring our normative substance, which we want to impose on the conception of autonomy, which we want to use in our public policies and laws, to the fore. We have to be transparent about it. And being transparent about it has a better chance of reducing arbitrariness and enabling contestations by those people who think the values and norms we impose are not the right ones or are too narrow, or too constrictive, than pretending that we could have normative neutrality. So I think we should own up to it and be as transparent as possible about it. And then, how do we fix the boundaries? of these competencies? How do we decide which competencies we require people to meet? Well, I think we should have a democratic debate about this and fix the um, boundaries of our conditions of autonomy, the normatively laid and normatively substantive boundaries by way of democratic procedures. Um, and that includes um, something which Derek Bolton has argued in his 2008 book, that we, in a way, decide what mental disorder in relation to which decision we as a community are going to count as autonomy interfering? It's a political, moral decision which we have to debate out and find a solution as a community. It's not just a psychological, psychiatric or biological decision. But I'm understanding that the fact that I'm appealing here to the demos might make many people worried. Uh, particularly the tyranny of the majority, if you just uh, started with Mill, I might mention him again here, um, is looming large here. But I think that there are some ways in which we can institutionally protect a little bit against that. I would think that, for example, including an asymmetric rated debate where those people who experience mental disorders, for example, or those people who care for those with a mental disorder, have a particular say in deliberation, in the drafting process, and in the contestation process of bills. And in that way, build in perhaps some kind of checks and safeguards. <clears throat> I also believe that um, there should be a sort of negative capacity regime where we err on the side of not interfering with people's autonomy just because of historical reasons of having learned that whenever we decided that people lacked the status of autonomy, we often had, came to revise it afterwards and regret very much what we put them through uh, in the past. Okay, I'm going to stop here and leave you some time to contest what I've been saying, but I've been arguing that autonomy cannot be captured successfully by issuing all the substance. Okay, good. Thank you, Fabian. The, um, very forcefully presented, I saw a head nodding in the front row there. So uh, we're going to take some time for discussion about this particular part of Fabian's presentation, and then we'll let him get on briefly to the other three points. Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself oh, as we sorry. go along? Hi, my name is Cynthia Stark. I'm at the Institute here. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about your um, claim about recognizable reasons, because it seemed to me that that criterion um, wasn't sufficient to um, 
to cause us to reject proceduralism. Um, because I thought there might be an equivocation. So yeah. to say that a reason is recognizable seems to me to just say, uh, recognizable as such, is to say that it could be recognized by someone, right? Um, it doesn't actually have to be recognized by anyone to be recognizable as a reason. And so it seems to me that the procedurals could just absorb that criterion, right? Because it's, it's merely counterfactual. So the procedurals could just say, as part of the procedure, the, the person has to rely on reasons that could be recognized as such. But that doesn't entail anything relational, because it doesn't entail that anybody actually recognized them. And so I'm not sure that it, that's really sufficient to say that that we have to discard proceduralism. It just, it, it, it just points to an amendment that we have to make on the proceduralist account. Yeah. You're absolutely right that what I presented doesn't make it the case that it's sufficient yet to defeat the procedures. I guess what perhaps the reason why I think it, it points in that direction at least is if you just think about um, the side of what it would be to recognize a reason. It seems to me that in order to recognize a reason, actually and counterfactually I'll come back in a moment, but let's start with actually. Um, I, I'm going to bring various norms and values to the table in order to, you know, for this, for the mindset of what I can recognize as a reason will be constrained by some norms and values I bring to the table. And that seems to me is true both actually of me, but it's even true of any counterfactual assessor. They can't, in a way, from the outside, recognize something which is a norm and value which is completely outside of their set of, recogni of recognizable values and norms. Now, that is a fairly weak constraint. But it is a constraint which says you can't be normatively neutral. Normatively neutral, in the strong idea, would, in a strong sense, would require that someone could hold a value, a norm, in their own way, which no one else might share, or no one else, even in the future, counterfactually might share. And it's against that idea which I've been mainly arguing. It seems a weak, weak constraint I'm bringing in, but the weak constraint carries normative substance with it, even if it's just a little bit of normative. Okay, so I think, can I just follow up for a second? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe now I'm confused about the difference between a view of autonomy being, norm autonomy being normatively neutral and it's being procedural. Okay. The, right, because, I mean, they're not necessarily synonymous, and the procedurals could grant non-normative neutrality, but also claim that he or she doesn't introduce any substantive constraints. Okay, let me clear that I'm feeling it's very difficult to get a kind of, because, you know, the debate is being fought in certain kind of terms. And I don't just want to idiosyncratically call things my, my own way. Okay. But in a certain sense, I agree with what you say. So let me try to translate that in, my ter in the terms of the debate. Proceduralists normally are committed to normative neutrality. So the people I've called good proceduralists are normatively neutral okay. procedures. Okay. Indirect substantivists, I call it function, allow for functional tests. And if you want to describe functional tests, they're just procedural. But they're not normatively neutrally procedural. So I'm proposing an indirect. Substantivist, okay. which I was proposing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Timo. Yes, my name is Timo Hilton from the School of Philosophy and Arts in Essex. And my question is actually related to this. So it concerns the move from the epistemic problem to the ontological claims that you make when you say that we cannot know whether a decision was made autonomously to the kind of claim that then that decision is not made autonomously, right? Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me that that needs to be added to. I, I actually agree with you, and, and also with the kind of things that there's a kind of familiar Hegelian <coughs> line about the nature of freedom and things that, that supports that view, right? That it is actually true that one of the contents of, of what it means to be autonomous is that, that you are able to justify yourself to others. But given the fact that there is a whole alternative tradition in which you frame this paper which would not agree with us, right? The kind of whole middle tradition which would say, why should it matter what other people, what third parties can say about our decision processes for the fact of whether they are, as a matter of fact, autonomous, right? That, that you need to say a bit more about why you actually think that it is justified to add that strong intersubjective test to, to the quality of, of autonomous, really, right? And I wonder whether you think that that in itself is just a normative problem, or whether you think that you can say that more about it. For example, you could try to say that it just is, as a matter of fact, untrue that you can make an autonomous decision. You cannot make an autonomous decision without doing it in a language that is, that is public. Right? So is that a stronger claim, or is it just a weaker claim that 
as a normative um, claim in our liberal democratic environment, we want to only accept positions as autonomous that could be just. Okay, good. Again, as I said at the beginning, I'm just reporting on some elements and some of the arguments obviously need to be supplied and hopefully are partly supplied also. But let me try. Um, partly because we haven't published that part. Um, I want to try out some ideas. I mean, there's a Hegelian story in which you can run it, and you're supposing the Mill story against it. I must, in a certain sense, understanding it in a broadly but Constinian way. That if, we, if it wouldn't be possible to actually recognize these reasons, if it wouldn't be attestable, then, it's not just that there are these, we can't know which of the two it is, one case of autonomy choosing, but for reasons we can't recognize, and another one where um, there's not autonomous choosing. But in fact, there is nothing left to, I mean, <coughs> if it's not recognizable at all, there is no difference. It can't just be a private matter, something which no one could ever find out which of the two cases it is. But I mean, if you don't, I mean, uh, much more would have to be said about this kind of, um, it can't be just a private matter whether someone has autonomy or not. It has to be publicly checkable. Not for Hegelian reasons, but for reasons uh, of a Wittgensteinian sort. But even take something that's the Mill case. Let me run it on the Mill line. I think on the Mill case, we are committed, not just that justice is done, but justice is seen to be done. I think we are committed to a certain kind of publicity. If we interfere with people's lives, we have to be able to give reasons for it. And to some extent, even if we leave them alone, we have to be able to give reasons why we left them alone. Why they're not in a state of immaturity. And we can interfere, we should interfere. <coughs> and in a way, you can just bring in this idea of intersubjectivity, just on the line of that publicity requirement of justice. The uh, gentleman on the left, sorry, yeah. <coughs> yeah, hi, I, I'm Joe, a student at Shedler. So I was just wondering about your criticism of proceduralism, particularly the third bit, right? So procedures are normatively substantive. I suppose the standard response is going to be this. Like, surely the procedures is going to want to say procedures are normative, but they're not normatively substantive, right? And so the norms involved in them are just going to be kind of minimal norms, so say epistemic norms, I mean you mentioned consistency, I mean there's nothing, yeah, so, so what's your response to that type of line, right? Okay, there's a twofold response. The first one is even such things as an inner, which seems so innocent as consistency, is in fact much more substantive if you think about it. If you think about it, then, you know, you might think, if we wanted to protect eccentricity, if we wanted to protect this idea of people acting in a way which is really quite different from how we normally go about things, then allowing for much, much more inconsistency is one way of achieving that respect for eccentricity. Second point is, there is, a, I think, a mistake in this debate when people think reasonable pluralism is just about values. If reasonable pluralism holds, if what we should do is use our state power in such a way that we can justify it to people who are willing to be convinced by argument but disagree after free discussion, then these people will disagree about epistemic norms too. And hence, normative neutrality, if it makes any sense at all, has to be much more extensive than people realize. It has to include epistemic norms, not just values. And once you realize that, then a lot of these procedures are not just substantive in a straightforward sense, but normatively substantive in my sense, in which I think it violates norms. I can see you want to reply to that, but I'm going to move on for now. I have four more names on the list. George. Uh, um, George Cooper, Institute of Psychiatry. Um, I just point of clarification, really. I, I'm with you right up to the very end. Okay. You surprised me. And I'm, all in favor of democratic accountability. But the way you put it, you said that you were looking at what counts as an autonomy disabling mm -hmm. mental disorder. Mm -hmm. It suggests a kind of status approach, okay. to, yeah. which you surely don't intend. No, I don't intend that. Sorry, that was, I was going too fast. What I mean is we are democratically decide on when certain disorders in relation to specific decisions <coughs> should be counted as autonomy interfering. I wasn't making the claim that it should be a status. But that still implies that, that it's the disorder that you're going to give some state of mind or a, a, a label and that is going to be associated 
with as the person not having the competency to do it. But that's what troubles me. Okay, I mean, I see what you mean. I think, um, I'm not sure that I'm, I can see that one might be thinking that the best way to do this is, would be just make no references whatsoever to mental disorder. Um, I'm not sure if I'm fully convinced by that yet. I, I, I agree that mental disorder has often been used in a stigmatizing way, but I'm not sure that it needs to be. But I think I can even give you no reference to mental disorder, insofar as um, I think you, could, you have to fix what kind of uh, conditions or what kind of circumstances undermine the normatively rich competencies to make autonomous decisions. And whether or not we agree that these conditions and the circumstances should be tied to any talk about mental disorder, I think that's a separate debate which we can have. But I think that view doesn't commit me to having to run that characterization in terms of mental disorder, even though I agree on the slides I have. Uh, partly that is because I wanted, because I'm not yet convinced that we should do without that, but that's a separate debate. Gentleman behind, please. Thanks very much. Uh, so Matthew Kieran from uh, University of Leeds. So on the second kind of objection to uh, procedure, uh, you said a criterion of some, so, sorry, let's get this right. Um, it can't be autonomous unless you exhibit uh, 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 the capacity, right? Okay. Um, what did you mean by that? Unless you exhibit the, the capacity to um, appeal to reasons, your phrase was. So what, what, what's the content of that claim? Because there's lots of different ways that can go. Okay. <laughs> what I mean is, if you don't... You know, <coughs> look, because, you know, I'm a Democrat about what these objective conditions are. I'm going, I can't exactly give it much more content. But for, a, for just the sake of argument now and reply, I'm going to say, autonomy requires a certain reason responsiveness. Where reason responsiveness uh, I can't characterize in a normatively neutral way. But it's a competency, it's an ability. Sure. And that means in particular that if you make a decision, I ask you why you make a decision on what seems like a decision, and I ask you why you make that what seems like a decision, and you give me an answer which I can't recognize as a reason, then I would say you're lacking autonomy because um, you're not reason responsive. Okay, so, so that's interesting, but now I'm worried. So the reason I'm worried is this. We know from a lot of psych experiments that people are very bad at articulating the reasons which in principle justify their decision. So now I'm worried your criterion is actually way too strong because now it looks like in principle you're going to rule out people because they can't epistemically exhibit the basis for their decision and that's pretty worrying. Yeah. I mean, I understand that in a, in a very... I don't understand. My claim is that they can't, it is not possible at all to find recognizable reasons. Even after you've taken all supportive measures and brought in all you know, ways of translating, of interpreting, all technical support and so on. But if, even after that you can't find any recognizable reasons, then I think, yes, I would want to defend that ultimately we can't uh, then find them autonomous. In a certain sense, it's not dissimilar to the fourth ability in the MCA, okay, which is the ability to express a choice. <clears throat> but moving like that makes it sound weaker, because now it sounds like the person is not exhibiting the capacity, but they are um, doing something which, in principle, the hearer could construe as uh, justifiable by a reason. And now we flip back to something like the first lady's. Uh, a response which is just going counterfactual dispositional is there some construal under which it could be construed as a reason and now that's very weak it is very weak but I think it still is a case that even on that counterfactual account you can't make sense of your interpreting activity unless you acknowledge that interpreting activity which is even on the counterfactual account required has normative substance that's all I'm saying. It's a weak, you know, certainly that's a very weak point. But the weak point has the strength to say that you can't be normatively neutral in the way which is this meant to be. John Adam. Yes, uh, thank you. John Adam, a psychotherapist and energist. I, 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 
I think I just want to say something to illustrate an aspect of what you were trying to argue. But um, the way I heard you describe the proceduralist position, it, all four points seem to me to boil down to is the, is the perceived decision egosyntonic? Um, they, they all seem to say the same thing, really. Am I the kind of person that drinks coffee? Yeah. Um, and, and, I was, uh, and I was interested to know, maybe this is a separate question, whether egosyntonic is confused with autonomous, because that would be an interesting confusion in the, within the debate. But I was thinking about um, Star Trek. Okay, um, and uh, it, it's life, Jim, but not we, not as we know. Maybe start from all the Star Trek, the next generation, and the first series. And, and what happens when you encounter a life form that you, you can't recognise as a life form on the criteria you carry with you on your spaceship, but nonetheless you, you appear to be confounded in your assumption that this is not a life form just because it doesn't meet the criteria. And and my and, my, and this links to the ideas about borderline personality disorder, which is not necessarily a mental disorder mm. to be discussed, um, and self-harm, because it seems to me that um, uh, people presenting with what we call borderline personality disorder and self-harm um, uh, uh, wrap themselves in the fig leaf of reason, of our reason, in order to get treatment. So they say, I did it because it made me feel better, or whatever it may be. Um, but if we, if we imagine that the, uh, the, the self-harm in the moment of the self-harm is, 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 is in a non-rational domain, then, um, and if we imagine that the consistency of ego is not uh, a, a predicate, if we're thinking about borderline personality disorder, then, then, then I think all we have is a consciousness acting in an environment we perceive. Um, and we can't insist on reason, which, I, which possibly goes to the straight point that you may be making. Um, but these these uh, accounts of egocentric decision making don't don't apply at all in this intermediate field of identity diffusion, um, which is not mental disorder. Yeah. Um, so there's so another there are forms that you're not recognising. Yeah. And there's a lot in there, John. I'm not sure if I can capture all of it, but let me just say at least supposedly procedural accounts. I think my argument was that they can't handle egocentric conditions well. Because, in a way, you're right, they reduce autonomy to egocentricity. Um, and I want to say that is exactly what is going wrong in these accounts. Um, I think. We want to say that there are cases where people have an egocentric condition, but still their autonomy can be interfered with. And these accounts can't capture that because they reduce it. So we better not reduce autonomy to egocentricity. On the borderline disorder case in the Star Trek, that seems to me, I'm not quite sure you have to think about that or talk to you more about that. But um, so there you're saying there are, not, there are cases which are intermediate, which are not egocentric, but they're, they're kind of identity diffusing and so on. I mean, in a way, if, I guess these accounts could have more traction on that. So that's why I didn't use them here. Uh, that's kind of an example. Because it might then be that there's no enduring identity or something like that. And that's why these accounts would say they're not autonomous. So that can't, that's not a good counterexample to these, these accounts. The egocentric account uh, versions of the condition are a good counterexample to this. That's why I was using um, the kind of cases of Brittany of eating disorder and the ships of mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I fully answered that, but perhaps we can take it up a little bit further afterwards. We're running out of time for discussion. Jorg, is it okay if <coughs> you take up your question later? I just want to get Michael Bach uh, give you the last question here. This okay. Day. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michael Bach um, from uh, Canada. Um, thanks, Fabian. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I think, until the end. Uh, it's, and, and I want to just pick up the same sort of comment that, that George was, was raising. And um, given, as we know, the, the contestable nature of the category of mental disorder. And, and, and your response was, Okay, let, let's not call it mental disorder, but at, at the minimum, there are some minimum, minimum critical specifications. And even there, I wonder, aren't we back at autonomy being something between the ears in the head? 
it, it's coterminous with a set of particular individual abilities. And um, so my, my question is, uh, where the act of interpretation is more than simply interpreting the reasons that I might give, it's in fact a form of support in an intersubjective way, um, say I have a son with a profound intellectual or psychosocial disability, and I furnish the reasons, but no one else can actually understand, I, because of my unique relationship with him, I furnish the reasons. Um, because I'm committed to his autonomy residing in space between him and various social worlds and legal worlds that he resides in. It seems to me that can respect his autonomy, even if he can't give the reasons. Good. So, no, I, and in, in which case, the autonomy doesn't reside in his head, it resides intersubjectively, but it seems to me we lost the intersubjective space, ultimately, at the end. Autonomy can only reside between my ears or in some other set of individual ability. No, okay, thanks for that. I mean, in a way, I think the way I want to respond to that is actually go on to the next point, because in a way, you know, I'm presenting them here as different constraints, but I think of them as actually interconnected and constraining the overall conception as a whole. And I, I but just to, uh, before I do that, just to briefly say, when I talk about competencies or abilities, um, that's what I've been committed to, and I'm agreeing that. I want to be a little bit neutral at this point, about how we understand this. Now, if you then ask me specifically what kind of more specific conception of autonomy I would choose, then I would understand competencies and abilities and not just in the hand. And that's in a way what I'm going on to. So I think just talk, I think it's too quick to think that if one talks about competencies and abilities, that need to be just something about psychological structure. That's what the next point is partly about. So I think. I'll uh, suspend them. Okay. <laughs> uh, but in that sense, I think um, being a little bit neutral among how you then specify it at this point, and then if you enrich it with the other thesis, you see that it has to be, it can be distributed among more than one hand. Okay, but let me get on to that. So um, here I'm going a bit quicker, but uh, partly because other things um, will be taken up as we go through the conference. But the second constraint on only any defensible conception of autonomy is that autonomy ain't just in the hand. And I want to make two particular points in this context. And the first one actually relates directly to it, that I think we should think of autonomy and capacity as distributed, as not just being in the hand of one particular person. So let's think about just a few cases like this. The first one is that I think even about the mind of an individual, we shouldn't think of that as just something which is contained in the skull. Um, for example, when I um, write a paper, I often make notes and so on, and then I forget the notes. But in a certain way, it's part of my extended mind that there are these papers, there are these things I've been written down, and I can recall with the help of these external prompts. So and even in that very basic sense, it's not just behaved in my skull. But take a more <coughs> example from the MCA context. Take something like the Advanced Directives of Refusal of Treatment or the LPAs, the Long uh, Lasting Powers of Attorney, where I either write a document about what kind of treatment I don't want or appoint someone who decides at some point that I lack capacity. In a certain way, <coughs> these are the extension of my capacity, and in a certain way, I want to say the extension of my autonomy beyond my head. They are in, in a legal document or they're in the power of a particular person to act on my behalf. And in that sense, I think, again, it would be mistaken to think of capacity or autonomy as just in the mind. Particularly also, I think that in many ways, even our decision-making is relying on the help from others. Um, so one example we often use in this context is think of someone who has dementia and has problems formulating sentences but they still have the ability to indicate whether they agree or disagree with what other people volunteer as the sentences which they might have wanted to formulate. So they start a sentence about a decision, but they can't bring it to an end, the dementia uh, doesn't allow them to do that, but various family members or carers volunteer various ways in which the <coughs> sentence is formulated, and then they can <coughs> indicate either verbally or non-verbally whether they agree with the way their choice has been expressed. And in that kind of way, you can eventually come to find out what their choice was, even if they can't 
fully full and formulated verbally themselves. <coughs> but even if you think about implementing the choice, imagine that you've been addicted to, to smoking or to coffee or something like this, and you then decide you want to give up smoking or coffee. And you decide, you know that you are not very well, very good at carrying out your own decisions. You might enlist other people to help you carry out this decision, to hide the cigarettes, to prevent you from buying coffee, I don't know, from, from reminding you in various specific contexts to, you know, that was your decision, you still want to carry that out and so on. And in a certain way, in these kind of cases, I want to say as well that our, your autonomy relies on that help, on that distributed capacity and autonomy with others to give you the kind of reminders to prevent you from certain temptations and so on. And in that way, autonomy aims just in the head. However, I think there has to be something what one might call residual capacity, which cannot be outsourced, at least not outsourced to others. I'm not saying that it's just between my skull, that might again be what I write down in an advanced directive and so on. But there has to be, like in the example of a dementia patient, there has to be still the ability to signal, for example, yes or no, or something of that sort. Certain things can't be outsourced to others. I think we can distribute our capacity to others to some extent, but certain things can't. And one, things we, one of the things we want to work on more is what kind of things can we outsource and what kind of things we need to keep residual within us, with us. The need to be just in the head. Now, this idea of distributed capacity is something which Wayne um, and the colleague Brian Higgison have been pressing in this piece, Mental Capacity in the Applied Phenomenology of Judgment. But again, this is on the camera. <coughs> so if you want to find out a little bit more about distributed capacity, that's the point to turn to. That's something we want to work on more. The second point about why I think uh, autonomy interests in the head is to do with this idea of relational autonomy. Now that notion was very much first introduced by feminist theorists who were objecting to this kind of autonomy of a Marlboro man, of a self-sufficient person who's independent of any kind of social context and uh, help. And the, the idea here was that we can have a notion of autonomy which builds in the social embeddedness of the self into the conception of autonomy, which doesn't rely on what might we call a kind of hyper-individualism, where the self is kind of created in itself completely independently of any social context and can have meaning and values and so on completely independently of them. Now, this idea has been picked up both in philosophy, but also in the law and in public policy. For example, the Muffet Council on Bioethics has endorsed it in various ways. And I think that's a very good thing. So there is a kind of acknowledgement that um, autonomy interests in the head, it relies on the social embedded self and the social embedded uh, capacities. But I think sometimes the way it's presented is that it is, um, that there are actually hardly any non-relation on this left. And that's kind of, it's kind of um, not well defined. So who would deny that the cell is socially embedded? I think even among philosophers, you won't find that many. Perhaps there is a reading of Kant, where Kant thought autonomy really resided in the transcendental self and was completely independent of any social embeddedness. But I think other than this reading of Kant, which probably isn't a good reading of Kant, there are really no non-relations. So the real issue is not, are we socially embedded and should we think of autonomy in a socially embedded way? But the real issue here is to get clear about what that means in which way are we socially embedded, and which kind of social embeddedness fosters <coughs> autonomy, and which kind of social embeddedness doesn't foster autonomy. I think we are a bit in danger here of saying, isn't that a good thing when we understand autonomy in a relational way, where we embed it in this intersubjective context? I think that's important. But there's a danger here that we just make autonomy too woolly, and that doesn't help clear thinking, or good policy, or good law. Now, one way in which we have tried to specify it a little bit more, is by introducing another term which also comes up in this Hickerson Martin article, and namely the idea of a decision community. Perhaps we should think of autonomy not just of an individual, but we should think of an autonomy of an individual in the context of a decision community. Are they part in particular of a functional decision community which helps them to distribute their capacity in a way which maximizes or at least enables their autonomy, or are they part of a decision community, perhaps an abusive relationship, which is dysfunctional in terms of autonomy? And even that isn't yet a full specification, it's just a conceptual tool to think about it. But one way in which Wayne, for example, has proposed to make it a little bit more specified, even though that needs further fleshing out, is what he's called the Eve standard. Namely, that autonomous determination can be determination by another 
as long as that other is an other whom I rightly recognize as appropriately not us. So the idea is very much like from the Bible that Adam recognizes Eve as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and Hegel would as geist of my geist, spirit of my spirit, and mind of my mind. So the idea is we have to think of a functional community as that one in which we can recognize ourselves in the others which help us uh, to carry out our autonomy. Again, there's a little bit more detail if you turn to one of the articles, Itineraries of Autonomy, German Idealism, and the English Mental Health Law. So I won't say more about it now, but the key message is autonomy anxious in the head. <clears throat> the third point is that autonomy isn't unconditionally good and does not jump all values. I again won't say much about it, but I just want to come back to the question with which we had once in one of our conference. And the question was, is autonomy a valuable idea? And I think there are various ways that you can answer that. The perhaps extreme view is to say it's always a valuable idea. But you might say, even if it's always a valuable idea, perhaps it can be overridden or trumped. <coughs> it can be a revisionist critic, what we call revisionist critics, who ex accept that autonomy is valuable, perhaps even always valuable, but not the only thing which is always valuable. It can be overridden or trumped sometimes. Or you might think, that autonomy isn't actually always valuable, but only sometimes valuable. Um, and then that is already a revisionist uh, criticism of another sort. And you might not, even there, the critics might say, no, in this particular instance, um, it's not valuable. Or you might say, autonomy is never valuable, then you would be a radical critic, where you say autonomy is not valuable for dependent creatures at all. At, at all. Now, we've been searching the land for radical critics. We haven't found anyone really who's come out to be a radical critic as much. We've tried to uh, come up with some possible constructions of radical criticism, but most of them have been revisionist critics. And to some extent that doesn't settle the matter, but I think there are reasons for being revisionist critics and not giving up on the idea of autonomy, but also not going gung-ho on it. And one reason has to do with what I started with, namely the idea of value pluralism. To say that autonomy would be the only idea that always trumps I think would overlook that the value of being alive, even if you're not autonomously determining yourself, might sometimes be important to protect even against autonomy. Minimizing harms both to yourself and others, the well-being of yourself, the dignity of yourself might sometimes conflict with autonomy, and perhaps the kind of things you owe to others in forms of relationship. So I think we want to hold dear autonomy, but because there are other values which we also want to hold dear, autonomy isn't the only thing, and it doesn't unconditionally always trump. There's a final point here which is not to do with value pluralism, but something else. I think we want to be revisionist critics. We want to hold on to autonomy, but also criticize it, because sometimes autonomy is construed in such a way that you lose touch with the idea that we also depend on others, and on the world, and that we have to be responsive to a world in various ways. And if you construe autonomy as being completely independent from the world, then I think you construe either autonomy wrong, or then it is not longer valuable. So here's an example. Louis Sars has argued that some forms of schizophrenia are characterized by a form of hyper-autonomy. So he takes basically Frankfurt's understanding of autonomy, remember it's ideal. Uh, higher order endorsement of your lower, lower order volition. And he says, in schizophrenia, the desire to be autonomous and idiosyncratic may be in itself the most prominent second order desire. So some forms of schizophrenia, he says, these persons with this condition would very much aim to be independently of any social determination, independently of the values and views of others. But it can take such an extreme that it becomes a kind of hyper uh, autonomy and overvaluing autonomy. So here's the description of a young man he knew, Philip. He would dance for hours while balancing on one foot in order to develop his own unique art form. So he wants to be really different from everyone else. He wants to be, live his own life in his own way. In a letter he declared his strong evaluation of independence autonomy, writing that he refused to be limited by ideas of normal, normal metabolism, and that the importance of reality is merely a social sanction, socially inevitable ruled by those involved in reality. So if autonomy gets to the point where you want to get rid of normal metabolism and the importance of reality, then perhaps there's a point where autonomy has become overvalued or hyper in a way which makes it problematic. And Wayne might come back to that issue of hyper-autonomy tomorrow, um, 
in another context, namely the context of anorexia nervosa, although he's also talking about various other issues. The final one had something to do with this idea of workability in practice. So, I want to say that one thing we learned through the last few years is that when we check for autonomy, we shouldn't perhaps check just for the things we normally uh, find in statutes and so on. But let me just remind you then of what the MCA said. The MCA, remember, understand is about mental capacity. Here, understand mental capacity as a necessary condition and proxy of autonomy. So when I check for mental capacity, I check ultimately to some extent for autonomy. If mental capacity isn't there, autonomy won't be there. And the MCA has this four abilities model, as you all know, the ability to understand the information relevant, to retain it, to use or weigh it, and to communicate the decision. And in many ways, I think there's much to be said in favor of it. But let me just briefly report on some criticisms. So I already mentioned one criticism, that in a way the MCA is too cognitive, it relies too much on this kind of information processing ability. And we need more about kind of the values of cognitive <coughs> elements. Now I'm not sure whether that's actually fair to the MCA. I think there's some control of the MCA, in particular the third ability to use a way which brings in this evaluative component. I think when we MCA talks about using or weighing the information, it understands that in such a way that evaluative capacities uh, are an issue. And in particular, we understand that perhaps better if you look at the US context, where when we talk about use or weigh in the US context, we mainly talk about reason and appreciate. Appreciate um, includes, and in my understanding at least, um, a sort of being alert to the normative issues, the values at stake, and appreciate how that applies in one's own situation. So perhaps that's a criticism which is overdrawn. There are two other criticisms I want to briefly highlight. One is, I already mentioned, this idea of the MCA is too intellectual. So that's about the decision making. If you talk to social workers, often they tell you this kind of stories where someone seemed to meet the four abilities of the MCA, and they decide to do certain things, and then they don't carry out their decisions. And then, you know, things get bad again, and the social workers come back and say, yeah, but you didn't you decide this? And they again make a decision which weighs information and so on, but they don't seem to be able to carry it out. So it might be that under some understanding of autonomy, perhaps you need to build in executive ability, the ability to carry out your will as a condition of autonomy. And perhaps the MCA isn't doing that very well. The one, one, one part of what we should look for in the assessment, which I want to talk a little bit more about, is that perhaps the MCA is too much construing our temporal abilities in a narrow way. It's too much focus on what at the material time of the decision making this person says about certain things. And it's not perhaps sufficiently, at least you might argue, taking in the wider character of our temporal, of our decision making and the wider character of it being temporal. So what do I mean with that? I mean with that particular the following things. Gareth, Matthew Hutter, Wayne and I are proposing that perhaps we should think about everyday decision making as involving four temporal components. If you make a decision, you deliberate about what to do, the first thing you might want to need to be able to do is if you think of the future as open, you experience the future as open. It's not a question of whether the future is open. I'm not making a claim about free will and determinism. I'm making a claim about the experience of a decision making. So experience the future as open, as yet to be determined. Secondly, I experience myself in the task of making a decision as shaping that future. It's not just that the future is open, but I take myself as what I decide now will have a consequence in the future. I bring some of it, I will have an impact on that future, and that's what my task of deliberation is. Again, it's not a metaphysical claim about what actually our decisions have an impact on the world, but it's what I experience myself as doing. If I experience myself as deliberating, I experience myself as thinking that I will shape the future which is open through my decision. Thirdly, among these various different futures which are open and which I can shape, at least partly shape, I recognize that there are normative differences. Some are better than others. Some are worse than others. There are other normative differences I might make. Fourthly, at least when it's deliberatively necessary, I can imagine these different future scenarios in some degree of detail. 
It's not just that I think of this feature as open, but I can actually think about what would it be like if I had to live with this condition? What would it be like if I had to go to a medical appointment all the time, or if I needed help with this and so on? So you actually kind of, in the deliberation, be able, at least when it's necessary, to imagine yourself into these scenarios. And what we want to say is that, at least with some uh, persons, and with some conditions, and in relation to some decisions, people sometimes cannot um, act, do not have these abilities or have these abilities to such a reduced extent that they cannot be autonomous. It might be, for example, that severe depression in relation to certain decision makes it the case that I think perhaps in the future, there is a future with various options, but the future is normatively flat. Whatever that I do, everything will be bleak and bad. And whatever happens, there is just nothing. Um, there is no normative differences in the future anymore. And we want to suggest that that sort of outlook, in a way, undermines the deliberation, the process of deliberation, or can undermine it to such an extent that this person lacks autonomy. Now, you might think that these temporal components are already implied in the ability of using a way. They're already in the MCA, they're just not explicit. So perhaps this is how it would run. If I lost the ability to experience the future as open, the decision-making can no longer make sense to me, since it's an activity that is concerned with shaping the future. So since the MCA is about decision-making processes, in a way it's implied in that, that, I, that the people who we assess think of the future as open. Similarly, we might think that if we have, the futures are normatively flat, then we can't make sense of choosing, of weighing, using a way. If I think of the future as normatively flat, it doesn't make any difference what happens, uh, then there is no using a way which can go on. And it might be similar with the other four components. So I'm not necessarily saying the MCA is faulty because it doesn't include these temporal abilities. But the point I'm trying to make is, if we want to assess what these abilities are, like use a way, we better dig down deeper and unpack what it means to use a way. And one thing which is included in use a way is a certain kind of temporal comportment and temporal orientation. And that's what uh, is often missing in those who are severely depressed. And that's an article, um, and that's what we argue in a forthcoming piece on temporal abilities and decision making and depression. Again, it's on the handle. Okay. We better stop. Yeah. This was a whistle stop tour. <laughs> This is what we argued. Autonomously cannot be captured successfully by actually normative substance. It aims us in the head. It's relational, it can be distributed. It's not unconditionally good, it does not trump all values in every context. And we need to enlarge the range of capacities to check. Thank you. We try to organize these meetings to have lots of time for discussion. So I propose that we, if we could take a few questions now, uh, run just if we can go five or ten minutes into the coffee period, and then continue in the other room. So, doors open. Yes. Uh, Fabian, on this last point about recognizing normative differences, um, what would you say about profound ambivalence? I'm not depressed. I don't look at the future as normatively flat, but every scenario I can imagine winds up by my own judgment as being of equal value. And so I don't recognize in the end, all things considered, normative differences among future scenarios I might enact, even though they're composed in different ways by different things I care about. Why would that defeat autonomy? It'd be practically a, a difficult predicament to be in, but I'm not sure why that would be equivalent to the case of, of depression. Okay, so let me just try to get that. So the, the idea is, in the case of depression, or at least in some cases of depression in relation to some decisions, we, we have these reports where people seem to say, the future is just normatively flat, whatever the decisions are, it doesn't make a difference. It's all bleak, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. And you want to say there's a different case, where people say, well, in this case, this is normatively at stake, but then there's this downside and so on, and in the other case, this is a case. Right. After all that, it doesn't really matter which of the ones I choose. They're all kind of in the balance. Right. Yeah, so I think I agree with you that that's probably a case where you might still say they're autonomous, even though in the end they flick a coin or something like that. Yeah. 
But I think the reason that is the case is that they're that you can still say they're engaging in some sort of deliberation. Sure. Where um, they, part of that deliberation is that they actually check on each of these futures and have a sort of traction on them where their normative differences which matter. And at the end of the deliberation, they come to a kind of recent judgment uh, where the recent uh, conclusion is, I could just flip a coin, there's no difference. That seems to me different, just from the phenomenology mm -hmm. of the cases I was imagining where someone doesn't actually go through that process, or perhaps at least not in that, yeah, and perhaps couldn't in a way go through mm -hmm. the process. There's something in which even that kind of deliberation of normative differences which might add up to normative equality doesn't actually, is, is disabled. It's also the case, isn't it, that if the ambivalence takes the form that there are pros and cons to different options, that's not really normatively flat. You're finding significant normative differences. Right, that's why I just read you. Yeah, I think decision. the term normative, recognizing normative differences needs to be a, a little bit more precise there. Yeah. Yes, is that work? Yes, yeah. that, I'm bored naturally. I, I'm afraid I'm a lawyer, so I come from a completely different mindset. <laughs> but it seems to me extremely dangerous to contemplate overriding people's decisions if they don't appear to us to have been made for any recognizable reason. Is it not illogical to say that people can make decisions for good reasons or for bad reasons, but not for no reasons? And what is the difference between a bad reason, for example, a reason based on a delusion, and no reason? Okay. I mean, in some sense, actually, uh, what you said at the end is part of, was part of my point. But um, <clears throat> reasons, rational and rational, are no reason at all. If you understand that to mean um, no reason at all, if I understand that to mean no reason which anyone could recognize, then I want to say at that point, we couldn't keep a decision which is done for reasons which no one could recognize couldn't distinguish that from a case where someone just couldn't decide at all. And then on a stronger claim, that means these two cases can't just be not kept apart, but they're not two different cases, they're just one case. There's no autonomy there. But when I mean, when I, that leaves still open that you have recognizable reasons which are irrational. Namely, Donaldson, in, a famous, in, this famous, in another famous judgment which has a similar formulation, goes on to say, I think religion, people acting on religious reasons are, from my perspective, irrational. They don't, they don't have enough warrants for their beliefs. But, that he doesn't say, but now I'm interpreting what he says, they are still recognizable reasons, insofar as I understand that there's a whole, a whole sort of institutional structure and culture around it, and people... Uh, People within that culture it can understand how, if you have certain other beliefs, this kind of thing becomes comprehensible and so on. So, in a certain sense, that is an irrational reason, which is recognizable. <coughs> so, the key point is about, it's not about whether they are rational or bad or good. The key question is, are they recognizable or not? If they're not recognizable, and if they're not embedded, for example, in a kind of social and cultural practice, which even if you don't share the beliefs or values of that practice, it makes it comprehensible why people hold the beliefs and values within that practice. Then it's not. Then you're faced with a non-recognizable reason. So I made this more complicated than, than it. <laughs> but in it practice, is. surely this end up would end up being no reason that the decision maker could or wanted to recognize. I want to lean on the first. Could recognize. So, take the example of... But other culture. people may be able to, even if this decision-maker couldn't. Sure. And that's the danger, surely. That is a danger, but I think, um, even if it's a danger, certainly just we have to live and find sort of procedures to, to find safeguards in order to minimize the danger. But I think if it's... The claim is recognizable, not by necessarily one particular person. So if you are finding yourself in a position where you say, this person acts on reason which I can't recognize, in that sense I can't think, I don't think they're making decisions, you better find more, you know, you better get a second opinion. You better find ways in trying to find out whether what they're saying can be made sense of by others, and so on. So you have to go through all of these procedures. But if in the end of these procedures you can't make sense of what they're saying, and others can't, 
you can't make these reasons recognizable through all the means uh, like support mechanisms, like consulting others and so on, then I want to say this person is not acting autonomously. You can't assess them to act autonomously and ultimately on the stronger claim they're not autonomous. It's a fun question here. Uh, Paul Herman, um, probably preempting tomorrow's discussion on uh, anorexia. Um, pro anocytes uh, I think it's the name of the sites now. Yes. I know they're a bit controversial whether actually encouraging anorexia to the extent that um, some people are. But surely they're, they're a supportive community with a premise that anorexia is some desired uh, property of being whatever is the case. Um, and I can't see any real reason why you, you, can, you could argue that they're a dis dysfunctional decision community, but I can't see how you can justify say that it isn't a reasonable conclusion from the premise they adopt. Um, what's the distinction between that, for example, and a religious belief? Good. And that's uh, one thing which I uh, also exercised about. And I agree that if one of, the re one of the ways in which a reason can become recognizable is that it's part of a shared practice of not just one person, but uh, more than one person, and these pro are that, then perhaps to some extent the reason becomes recognizable. But remember, rec recognizability is only one of the constraints on autonomy, not the, not the only one, and not a sufficient one. If you meet recognizability, it doesn't necessarily mean you're autonomous. Uh, my point was just, it is one of the constraints, and we should <coughs> own up to it, I know up to the fact that it carries normative substance with it. Cynthia, do you want to come in? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I just wondered if you could say something about the first two. Um, so, so I know those are logically distinct criteria, but, I, but it seems to me that what's going on with the proceduralist is, is that he or she sees those two as um, <coughs> Interdependent, and the, well, let me put it the other way: the substantivist, the substantivist. Part of the reason the substantivist wants to be a substantivist is because she sees, uh, she thinks relational factors are relevant, and relational factors, um, if, if you make them part of the criterion of autonomy, are are, are substantive, right? Yeah. So, so that even though these are logically distinct criteria, they 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 have this really important interplay with one another in the dispute between substantivists and proceduralists. I disagree on that. Um, okay. I think that's to conclude too quickly. So, I think you can be a proceduralist and a relationist. <coughs> so, someone like Crispin yeah. is a proceduralist, or yes. claims to be one, but I say that. Assuming that I'm wrong, that there can't be proceduralists, <laughs> he's a proceduralist. <laughs> okay. um, and he wants to be a relationist. It depends what kind of relationist you are. So, Crispin says, in order to develop these uh, capacities, the procedural to engage in the procedures required. You need to be situated in a social community and you rely on social meaning and so on. Right, so there's a causal relationship between... There's an, exactly. But it's not constitutive. Good, but, then, but it, then it depends what you mean by... When I deny it ain't in the head, it may not mean that it has to be constitutive of autonomy, that it's in social relations. Okay. <clears throat> okay. A relationist can be a weaker relationist and just say, in order to exercise my autonomy, I need to rely on others. In order to develop my autonomy, I need to rely on others. And in that sense, proceduralists often are relations. In fact, in that sense, hardly anyone is not relation. Right, right. Great. I think we should thank Fabian for uh, kicking this off.